everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. Happy Taco Tuesday. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Isn't it ironic that over St. Patrick's Day and Cinco de Mayo, two, let's just say, notorious heavy drinking days, we can't even go out and find a bar to have a cocktail. So I hope you're all at home enjoying your uh, your Cinco de Mayo. Have some tacos. I'll be having some tacos as I watch a fish concert tonight, surprisingly. All right, we'll start things off with what happened in our marketplace today. Do our top seven, and then I will go to our guest, who's going to be Larry Jacobson on the program. As you guys know, Larry is a, a, a follower of Mr. Buffett, and Mr. Buffett had their annual shareholder meeting this weekend. And there were some very interesting things that came out of that. I was speaking with Larry about that over the weekend. I thought, you know what? I really want to uh, bring maybe a different perspective than you're reading on mainstream media, what that might mean. So we'll talk with Larry after our first uh, our little opening segment here. If you guys have anything that you want us to address on today's show, please type it into our chat on the YouTube channel. You can also go to TraderMerlin.com and send in comments and questions there. And hello, everybody out there in social media space. Good to have you all with us. Uh, good, uh, good to see you, Kevin. I actually... Um, I actually responded to your question on uh, our YouTube page out there. Hopefully you got that one. If not, I'll probably do it again on the show as well. Yes, it's always a good time to be alive. Is it not? It's a great time to be alive. All right, let me go into our top seven markets for um, we're on May 5th right there. It's our Cinco de Mayo. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom, work our way up to the top. The 10-year, not really anything that noteworthy. We're just going sideways, so I'm going to skip through that one much quicker. Gold. Remaining relatively unchanged today, almost the same thing as yesterday, a small little tiny green body, really nothing to speak of there that's exciting. So again, we won't move on. Now we start with the interesting stuff, the indexes. The indexes had much greater gains than what they finished with. You see the Russell here ending with a 1.02% gain up to 1268, but you notice it's got this long topping tail here. Now we could pick this one apart and talk about trends and what it means for the overall trend. It's obviously not a very positive sign for the Russell right now, but we'll have to wait and see what the next day or two uh, brings us. All in all today, it was positive to the tune of 1.02%. Okay, Bitcoin gave back some of its uh, peak. It was over that 9,000 just a couple days ago. We are down below 9,000 again. 8,985 is where we closed at today for Bitcoin, or where we're at at this exact moment on Bitcoin. Uh, it actually just jumped up to 9,030. 30 on the future. So that's our, our, our final there with regards to what Bitcoin is doing. Now we get to the S&P. Starts to get a little bit better. The chart doesn't look as weak, right? That topping tail is not a, a long topping tail. It's just kind of a medium one there. So it's it's showing better strength out there for the NASDAQ, or sorry, for the S&P 500. 1.22% is what we moved up to. That was at 28.59. Uh, for those that want to know, I did add to a short position on the S&P, not only with my options, my put options, but also with the ES futures. So um, uh, position is getting a little bit bigger here for me to the south side. Next on our list is going to be the NQ. That was the best performer from our index perspective. 1.56%. You'll notice a bigger green candle, uh, less distance off of the top, but still closing below that 9,000 mark at 8,932 on the day, making it your number two performer. But again, we look at crude oil. It is, again, your number one by a long shot. And another 20, well, right now it's up almost 24%. Absolutely crazy of 24% gain on crude oil right now trading at $25 and 28 cents um, It's kind of bummed that they wouldn't let me buy those crude oil futures at seven dollars like I was trying to do on the 21st uh, Or still restricting me from trading crude oil futures. Gotta love you trade station. Thank you so much But uh, we, we make do in other areas and other investment vehicles right now crude oil coming right into an area where I actually think it might uh, stall and have a little bit of an issue breaking through this 25 and a quarter mark but after that you know 30 seems like a very very logical target probably closer to 33 uh, for crude oil there before any real real stops along the way all right that is your top five marketplaces out there not uh, really exciting except for crude oil which has been on the move I know some of you have been asking me about looking at UCO and USO Oh, man, I really, those are weird. They're acting very weird. They're not really moving in the percentages they should be moving. So to me, they seem kind of broken right now. Um, but it is one way to play those if you want to use the ETFs. Now, our topic du jour, as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about um, Mr. Buffett. And Mr. Buffett has... An annual shareholder conference, the Oracle of Omaha, everybody descends to Omaha, Nebraska, and goes to his shareholder meeting. Why? Because, well, arguably he's one of the richest in the world. I think he's still top three. Uh, might have lost a little chunk of change in the past few days, but he's certainly in the top three or five uh, of richest people in the world. So his views on the markets are always 
scrutinized and looked at in detail because of what he has to say. So today we're going to break down what Buffett said at his conference in Omaha, Nebraska. Actually, I don't even know if it was in Omaha. I'm assuming it was. Uh, I don't follow it as much, but my guest that's on the program today, I'm going to say he's an addict. He's a Warren Buffett fanatic. He's got a tattoo of him on his left buttocks cheek. We've got Mr. Larry Jacobson joining us today. Larry, how you doing? Great, Marlo. I haven't been on the show with you in a long time. I'm actually looking studious today with my glasses on. Last time you were on the program, you didn't have a beard, so that basically you guys can see how long it's been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. No, it's pretty exciting. You know, I did spend the five and a half hours uh, streaming on you, you know, Yahoo Finance. Happens each year in the meeting, but this was a little different than most, as many people realized or have heard. They actually did hold the meeting in the same location that he'd normally hold the meeting. They set the, the table up, the dais table, but there was eerily two things that were missing in this meeting that had never seen in the time I started following Buffett back in the 90s. Yeah. One empty room. I mean, the entire picture, like the four, like the Staples Center, a basketball arena, empty, yeah. except for this one table sitting there. So it had this kind of eerily feel to it, but the bigger thing that I've not seen, and you could tell Buffett was a little shaken by it, Charlie Munger was not with him. Right. It was the first time Munger, they probably decided he's 96 years old, why have him fly out, nobody's there. So interestingly enough, they had Greg Abiel, who is the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway's Energy and Vice Chairman of Non-Insurance Operations for the company, with him on stage. Now some have been kind of speculating that a, a, a deal might be the successor to Buffett someday. So it's been interesting. They've been starting to share more and more about the two pickers that Buffett uses all the time now, who came on to Berkshire a few years back. And now you see a deal there. But we shouldn't read into this. It pretty much was a deal is in Omaha. It wasn't much of a drive. There wasn't any risk there. But like I mentioned, you could hear it in Buffett's voice. And the meeting was 95% Buffett. So imagine at his age, 89 years old, he held this meeting for five and a half hours. It was pretty amazing. But here's the key thing, that if you listen really closely to what Buffett was talking about, he was kind of in his own words, kind of going ahead and having a deep sense of concern about the immediate future. Normally he's really optimistic, he's cheery, he's kind of folksy, but it was almost as if he was warning investors and policymakers in this particular meeting. So I thought if you wanted to, we can kind of go through, and you and I can go back and forth on what the meanings were here. But obviously, what do you think the primary biggest thing that most people were wanting to hear from Buffett about? What do you think that probably would be? Uh, probably about his stance on the economy and what this whole coronavirus issue means to him and his company, which, of course, it lost $40 billion in the first quarter, so uh, it hasn't been very good. Right. And in fact, it actually went a little deeper because there were people right now that were actually kind of scratching their heads. He's sitting on a record $137 billion right now. And most people are kind of confused. And with this kind of correction now, first you have the instant reaction knee jerk to the panic. And then there was this reaction right here. But Buffett wasn't buying. And so it kind of threw a lot of people off is what's going on right now, you know, he's got a lot of liquidity, but what he said, which was very fascinating, he sees this very different from 2008. Now, when 2008 hit, remember, the Fed was very slow on going out there and doing anything initially. And so Buffett got a lot of phone calls from a lot of nervous corporations kind of asking, you know, can they make a deal? Can they borrow money? Because the, the federal government wasn't doing anything. Well. He got some really great deals back in that day, but here is the thing that really was a changer here. He served more as a lender back in 2008, and he said right before the Fed jumped in this time, and he said the Fed really kind of superseded him. They kind of went right in there this time, right. but he said he was getting some phone calls, but they were lousy deals. There was nothing like 2008 that he really felt was any way attractive to what he was looking for. And he basically went ahead and said in his own words, you know, after the Fed acted, a number of them were able to get money in the public market at terms that he wouldn't have given them. So the idea that the Fed is kind of jumping in this time, maybe they learned something from 2008. Uh, they were definitely more on top of it this time. Is it is it that, Larry, or is it? I mean, I look at I can look at it from two different perspectives. Number one, maybe he didn't get what he was looking for, or number two, he's thinking, I see this market getting much worse. Therefore, I'm not going to commit at these prices. So, 
I mean, was there any any hint of yes. that that you got? Yes, and that's kind of what I was going to go into a little bit later. But Buffett's not confident here right now. This is very different. And it was funny because you know what he did? hes I've never really heard him do this before, but it's worth for anybody who's really interested in understanding around the Great Depression. He went back and did kind of a mini history lesson of what happened around the Great Depression and the crash in 1929. He spent a lot of time kind of analyzing what the markets did between 1929 and 1951. He said it took 22 years for the markets to recover. And he's concerned, he may not have openly said it, but he's not really sure what's going to happen now with this virus, and more importantly, what is the world going to look like when all this kind of comes back. So he's being very cautious right now, but what this tells me, and, and probably tells our listeners too, who's spent some time here, he's probably looked at this this rally up is purely just a correction. And if you kind of look around 1932, similar kind of rally here, and then there was a big drop fall off. Yeah. So, you know, we, you and I have kind of talked about this. I've been saying a lot in uh, Twitter and other things, I've been finding so many similarities to 1920s that we're seeing right now. I mean, you can just list them. I, I put out an article a few months back that they compared the year 2010 or the 2010s to the 1920s. Here we have this major kind of crash. You also had in the Spanish flu yep. pandemic that came out. And for all intents and purposes, much worse than corona here. So there's some things going on that we just have to be paying attention to. And you're absolutely right. Buffett was kind of alluding to this and what I would say is he was kind of warning investors and traders, hey, it's okay to be buying, but be very careful where you're buying right now. So it kind of gave me the feeling like we haven't seen the worst yet. And you and I have been kind of talking about that as well in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to actually bring up some uh, the, the screen here because I thought it was interesting to hear – some of his comments about sectors. So, you know, we know Buffett is this guy who says, if I'm going to buy one share, I'm going to buy the whole company, and I'm going to kind of hold it forever. He basically was very clear. He unloaded all of his holdings in airline stocks, which I went, whoa, okay, that, that's a, a bad sign, obviously, if you're thinking about going long airlines. So let me just bring up uh, the daily here of airline stocks. You guys can get, uh, I don't have an ETF for it, so I'll bring up, um, here's American Airlines. You can see that the last couple of days, it was a big gap down on Monday morning and still looking pretty weak. I mean, you can get American Airlines for nine bucks right now. Crazy considering it was at 30 in February. Uh, UAL was one that I was I had been checking out. It's at 24 right now, still not past the lows from early March. Um, and I'm pretty sure you could you could put dollars to donuts that a large part of that sell-off there is Berkshire Hathaway unloading in his uh, you know 10%. I believe he had of United Airlines. You've also got um, Love. He he didn't spread the love there. You got Southwest Airlines. He was unloading as well. I mean, uh, Southwest Airlines at 26 bucks to me seems like a deal. But you know, if Warren Buffett is out there, Larry saying, "Hey, I am unloading all this stuff," what is I know what, what what do you make of that? I mean, is that saying, hey, I, I see I could, this sector or the, the market as a whole? No, let me explain because he actually talked about it. He was very bullish around 16 on the airlines. And what he said, which was very fascinating about why he sold the airlines, his rationale had more to do with the larger economic implications that's maybe happening here in the globe, in the country. It wasn't because of financial challenges with the airlines. I will see, and having worked in travel and done some work with travel in my past, uh, I can tell you right now, after 2000 and, and, and 2011, right, I'm sorry, 2000, uh, September 11, 2001, it took two years for the travel industry to come back. Mm -hmm. But that was a one-day event. You know, here, we're going to see repercussions of this because it's not just about, okay, nobody's flying right now. What's the next phase of this? Are people going to be comfortable enough wanting to get on an airplane again? Uh, can they withstand this type of pressure? And right now, they're trying to raise money. Boeing is out there trying to put bonds out there and raise more money. So I think Buffett's point in this was, wow, it doesn't make any sense for us to hold this. We don't see any potential long-term upside in the short term right mm -hmm. now. So maybe, and using the Buffett met, met, uh, mentality, he might be believing this could go even lower and then it gets to a point where it's a good deal for him. But that was why he really stated that he got out of it because he kind of said he was in this for the airlines. And right. now it's almost like, you remember back in the 80s, Buffett kind of dabbled in airlines with U.S. Airways, and he said never again. He thought it was horrible, <laughs> horrible business model. But he yeah. thinks it's 
improved. Well, and, and now it's it's going to be worse because obviously you have the, the fear of people being in confined spaces with a lot of other people. You know, like what are we going to have? We're going to have two people per row now because it has to be so spread on an aircraft. And I think Joseph here says he said that he could not see any clear guidance in the airline industry. Yeah, and I think we'd all agree that there is a massive amount of uncertainty there. Now, I've made this point that if we were to stack up airlines next to like the cruise ship industry, one of those is clearly going to fail, and that's cruise ships because it's not going to get the bailout. Did Buffett mention anything, um, you know, because obviously we know Boeing is such a huge component of the Dow, or was a huge component of the Dow, still has a lot of power there. I've had this question before, people saying, hey, should I be buying Boeing? And I'll bring up the Boeing stock here for viewers at home just so you can take a peek at it. You know, Boeing right now trading at 125, considering it was over 340 just a couple of months ago, seems like a screaming deal. But my argument is this, if you have a, an airline industry that's uncertain, and right now air, airplanes are just stacked up on tarmacs at airports around the world, what's gonna make me as United CEO go out there and say, you know what, I need to buy 37 new Boeing jets. You know, I'm gonna use what I got to get started. And it could be years before, before all of a sudden Boeing starts to have uh, their sales engine back up to normal. To me, that's, that's a dead company out there. Did he mention anything about uh, Boeing? Other than just saying he thinks it's a great company, you know, it's, uh, you know, most of the message here right now is, you know, do you wait? And I, that's just me saying it, not him. Do you wait to see how this all kind of falls out? Because I think we all could kind of believe, I mean, I don't think this is the end of anything right now. If anything, I think we're just about to hit the beginning of it. Yes. You know, uh, everybody kind of, and you and I were joking when we were back on Power Trading Radio, we were talking about how Q1 this, but you got to remember, I mean, the Q1 earnings only reflect a small portion of what has happened here. It's going to be the Q2 earnings. And think about when that's about to hit. Right in the fall, where we tend to see crashes happen, don't we? So <laughs> convenient. <laughs> convenient going into an election year. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things start to develop right now. But again, I think it's about Buffett's mentality. If it's a great company and you can get it for a great price right now, then it's worth doing. I think Boeing also has still the problem to overcome with the mock planes. We really haven't heard much about that with mm -hmm. all the other distraction going on. So again, it's one of those things where there's, I didn't get the sense that I normally hear of a Buffett and Munger saying, back up the truck. That's usually their kind of belief. When they find something that's just too good to pass up, they don't scale into it. They go all into it. Right. And so the only thing I can address, and you and I kind of talked about it before I came on, what I will share is maybe what he said might be coming next. Maybe that will be helpful. Okay. And so he basically said with everything that could be reverberating throughout the economy, we could see energy, real estate, and retail industries start to face some real problems. Why? Because those are things that are dependent on other things happening, right? So right now, there's probably nobody out there buying and selling houses. Right, you really haven't made people out there, you know, with energy. Energy right now, I mean, look at gas prices. We're starting to see maybe oil rebound a little bit. But if you go to a gas station, it's not packed anymore. Right. It's, it's the roads aren't packed anymore. And then he's believing that if these three sectors start to feel some pain, it's going to build right in or roll right into the banking system. So here's how that all happens. Remember, we talked about this on power, and people tend to forget. So let's just kind of remind them. In August, we had an inverted yield curve. Well, they normally say within 14 months, we could see a recession. The question in everybody's mind is, now with this other black swan event of having the coronavirus and what we all are believing, because the one thing we've gotta be reticent of is we haven't gotten any real information. I mean, we're not getting real statistics. Uh, we live in the state of California, and this is my new nickname, I apologize, Governor Nuisance basically looks like he's going ahead and he's targeting Orange County because they didn't follow his rules, but other beaches were open. Arizona just opened this week, uh, on May 8th, around this time. We've got to start getting some answers here because clearly people are impatient and the government's not doing a good job of communicating what's really going on with us right now. Yeah, uh, Joseph says some kind of... Uh humorous but also i think it's on point he says civil unrest will be will come if we have a second wave and and i agree i think that that, that could be we'll find out here in southern california in about two weeks after the protests have been going on in huntington beach over the past weekend i mean seeing all those people that close it makes you wonder you know are we going to see a big spike up here with regards to uh the coronavirus in socal uh let's talk a little bit about those sectors that you mentioned you mentioned energy 
Um, yep. Obviously, energy has already taken a pretty significant hit. Um, right now, I'm looking at XLE, which I'll share with the viewers, out at 37.12. Um, you know, I think large reason why we've seen that thing move up has been that crude oil is starting to move up. Uh, of course, this is not just crude oil; it's energy companies. Um, you want to go run through those three real quick, kind of from maybe from a, what your perspectives are on the trends there. Yeah, I think right now energy usually is something we see turnover when we start to get into bear markets and more recessive times. I think with real estate, you know, you've heard this over and over again, and we've got to really take this for what it's worth. We're potentially sitting on three bubbles, right? We've been hearing this for the last couple of years. Stock bubble, real estate bubble, and yep. bond bubble, right. right? And so right now the question is, when you got Jerome Powell saying we're not going to do anything again, you know we know that prices have been gearing up, but there's been no talk of inflation for years. I, I think at this point, you know, the bigger concern we should all be worried about is, and it happened in 2000, it happened in 2008, when we start to see the beginnings of a true downtrend. Right now, we just have a down segment and an up segment, right? But when we see prices break down and break that low again. That's when we start to see what we say, you know how they say all, you know, all high tides float all boats? Yep. Well, what is going to be the crap that's going to be sitting at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> that we don't know about again? Right. And I think those are the things that we got to be really attentive to right now. And I think there will be some bargains. But one of the things we talked about in one of the last sessions we did together, we called that our hazmat session, if you remember. I uh, <laughs> we, ba we basically talked about the fact that, you know, you can't just go out there and say it's cheap right now. You've got to find companies that can weather these type of storms and will survive something like this. There are a lot of companies right now. Uh, I didn't get a chance to read it, but I saw a breaking news headline that one of the top retailers, you know, a restaurant retailers might not come back from yep. this. So, uh, and then on top of it, where nobody's kind of really, I mean, there's so much coming at us, we don't think about it. Uh, the beef industry, the pork industry, they're closing plants right now. This is going to impact our food chain sources. And so, I, I, you know, it's very, very difficult right now to see. The only silver lining, because, you know, Buffett has a silver lining through all of this. Of course. Uh, you know, he basically said that even though uh, at this point he's not predicting doom and gloom, he just isn't sure the way this is going to head into the future. He's going to wish everybody the best. And, you know, he says if the right deal comes along, he'll jump on it. Uh, but he was preaching almost throughout... Wow. Don't bet against America. You know right. that America will come back. It's always come back, and it's still one of the greatest investments you can make is in America. But again, you know how long is this going to go on for? How is our government and the world going to react to this? And there's going to be pain. And as much as we we can do bailouts right now, yep. what we're seeing is they're just printing money, more money. <laughs> sure. Okay? And so what is this going to mean when we, when we tip? You know, there could be a Great Depression again. We don't know. Right. And I and think that, that's. And, yeah. and that goes right back to his point. You know, we, and I've made that on this show as well. It's like, I, I'm, I'm a patriot, I'm an American, and I'm not saying bet against America, but there are times when things get overvalued or you have a systemic issue. And I feel like we're in that, that mix right now. And to hear Warren Buffett uh, bearish on energy, financials, um, real estate, and then retail stocks tells me that he sees more downside movement. And he's not saying bet against it because America sucks and it's the end of, of end of America. It's saying, look, yeah. we are due for a pullback, a, a return to normality since we've had this massive run-up. Um, there have been a lot of inflated asset classes out there. You know, a question came through from one of the viewers that said, do you see us going more, maybe you can answer this one, do you see us going more towards an inflationary type of market or depression, uh, deflationary type of market? Well, again, it's hard to see. I mean, we've had no inflation market right now. Right. So, the, so the question is, by simply now addressing inflation, if they do this the wrong way and they start raising interest rates, they could topple the bond market, right? I mean, there's so many little houses of cards going on right now. And if we go negative interest rates, then you're basically paying someone to, to loan them money. Crazy. <laughs> it makes That's absolutely nice. no sense to us, right? So it's hard to say right now what they're going to do. Are they going to go the Volcker route, where they basically did de -inflate, de disinflation back in the 80s? I, I think we just have to wait and see. But one of the things I think it's important right now is to really look at your portfolio at this point in time when it's in a at least a, a, a visual that we might be back. You know, what's that old saying, Merlin? That you, you, you get a you, not everybody gets a second chance. And you had a friend. You might want to share that story. Remember, she called you right after that first 
collapse yep. Yep. and it came back and she was able to get out. This might be a time that, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do. If you are educated and you know what the market has the potential to do, then you could be doing options, you could be shorting the market. There's a lot of different ways to protect your portfolio, but you need to understand how to do that. And most people out there right now are sitting on 401ks, probably heard the speech of, from their mutual fund managers or their IRA managers or their, their you know, brokers saying, don't worry, it's going to come back. And when these little things happen with these type of mini corrections right now, they start to believe their brokers and everybody again, and they start to not worry about it. This is the time I believe I would be a little bit more diligent in what might be coming down and really start taking inventory and ask yourself, can you sustain a massive correction and go back to 2008 and look at how you handled that situation and ask yourself if you could have done better. Yeah, there certainly are going to be a, a lot of, um, we'll just say ups and downs coming. I know I see a lot of people here, uh, and I agree with you fully, this is actually the chart of the week I did on last Saturday, was looking at the unemployment claims and saying, no, our economy still hasn't factored in all this unemployment that's coming. You're hearing now retailers going bankrupt. I'm hearing a lot of chatter about how attorney and law firms are now gearing up for a massive influx of bankruptcies, which you know, again could be why Buffett is showing some concern out there because we could look at that ETF for, uh, um, for retailers, XRT, uh, and a lot of people might think that whole sector is going to suffer. That's not true. There are companies in there that are going to do phenomenally well. For example, if you look at the retail ETF XRT, 2% of it is Amazon. I'm yeah. pretty sure Amazon's not going to sink with the economy. You know, they might have a little bit of a blip, but they're still going to perform very well. Um, there are other companies down there that are just piles of steaming manure that are going to go bankrupt here in no time. I mean, what was it? Well, what was the one that went? It was J. Crew, I think, went uh, bankrupt today. You'll have, you know, you have J.C. Penney, Sears, Macy's, all these ones. Going to be dodos. Are going to be going the way of the dodo. Now uh, that said, I need to give you a big shout out as I look at the clock here and kind of running out of time. Uh, I, I was hoping to get the spreadsheet from you to talk about your the portfolio you've been building over the years. I want to bring up two stocks here, um, actually one that I hate, and I just I'm, I hope that this company <laughs> burns go. in hell. Live Nation. I'm glad that they're down at forty bucks. I hope this company goes bankrupt, and a real honest person who understands fans of music <laughs> will step in there and do this the right way because this is a corrupt organization. Uh, this is like run by Gotti or some mafia crime syndicate. Don't, 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 don't mince words. How do you really feel? <laughs> but, um, you know, we are, we're in a market right now that is down, we'll say, roughly 16% from its peak. And some of your, your uh, portfolio pieces that you've been talking about, why you put those in the portfolio that you've been tracking, have been doing very well. I got to bring up uh, NVIDIA, NVDA, which uh, is not at the market highs, but it's only down a little bit. It suffered yeah. initially, but really had a phenomenal rally. But there's one in particular, which I just didn't see coming. And of course, this is why we love having Larry on and different traders and investors, because there's different perspectives of these markets. Shopify, goodness gracious, Shopify is up 100% in a month. Well, you understand, with Shopify, what was so attractive is everybody wants to get into the online business right now, yeah. and they provide the carts. So Amazon attached to Shopify. You have a lot of big corporations using Shopify right now. Yeah. And so a lot of smaller businesses are now realizing, and why they're getting a lot more attraction here is think about that you own a small business, and the only way maybe that you can do business if you're a brick and mortar is to now have an online presence. Well. How do you go about getting an online presence? You got to build a shopping cart. You got to build the B2B right now. And, and that's what Shopify is really good at yeah. doing. And so it just happened to be at the right time. And I think we were very fortunate when we started finding those couple. It was late 2015. You know, the markets, they're cyclical. And so, like, the one thing that Ben Graham taught Buffett was there are going to be these opportune times where the company is not broken, but the stock is. And it's still a great company. It's just been mispriced a lot lower than what it should be valued at. And I think why Buffett's portfolios endure so well, you got to remember, he's not buying it even at fair value of where it should be bought. He's buying it through a margin of safety. So a lot of what we were looking at early on there, they were way undervalued of what they should have been selling at. And I think that has given it a bump. And then on top of it, if you take a look at some of these companies that you and I were looking at, uh, they fared pretty well even in that massive correction. Yeah, really now, well. go, going really quickly, if I can, to Amazon, I think where they're going to get impacted 
is if we start to see the economy get worse and worse and people just don't want to spend money. Right. That's where they're going to get impacted. And remember, they've got so many tentacles out there. You know, so I'm starting to see, you're starting to see different things going on. I just read today that 25% of, of Airbnb's staff was let go today. So this is really starting to permeate the entire economy here. Sure. And hopefully this wasn't by design. Now, I'm not a conspiracy, conspiracy, but at this point, you start to watch the class action lawsuits starting to happen, too. So there's a lot going on around the virus right now. Uh, and how much money can the government print? You know, uh, one thing I will say is that the unemployment rate is now higher today than it was even in the Great Depression. Now, we can all say the population's greater, yes, but this is something to take a look at right now. There's a lot of people out of work, and I think we just got to be really aware of what we know and, more importantly, what we don't know. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and, and they're starting to – I think there's some optimism out there. And I mentioned this on the show a couple of weeks ago, actually probably a week ago. I said I'm changing my perspective. I'm actually very, very nervous about taking home short positions on the S&P, which I've been doing almost every weekend. I uh, was very nervous about that because at any moment they're going to say, okay, we're going to open things back up. And you're going to have this, I believe, this last surge of optimism, which I believe is happening right now into that 2900 yep. mark on S&P. Yep. That's that last surge. And then it's the realization. It's like, okay, you can, you can open up the park again, but no one's coming. Right? Where are you going to yeah. go? You're going to go work yeah. at your J. Crew job? Not there. Uh, there's a local restaurant down the street from my house. I know they want to open up, and they're probably going to open up, but they're going to get probably half or a quarter of the normal uh, attendees because people are still fearful of this. So this will be a slow process to get this thing rolling, and I think you'll see more layoffs because of that. So it's it's weird. We want to start up as soon as possible, but we can't, which means we'll further exacerbate the problem of unemployment, of retail sales, and these types of numbers. So um, that's why I've got my bearish stance out there. Well, keep one more thing in mind, too, is that normally, scientifically, they've proven about 45 to 60 days it takes to change a habit. We have been quarantined enough to start thinking that this is the norm. Yes. And we're going to be fearful about wanting to go back to the way it was. And that's where I wonder, is there something bigger going on that wants us in this new paradigm? But, you know, it definitely won't, you know, there are going to be a, a section of our our economy that is not one going to go back out there just because they're opening up and a yeah. lot of people that will and I think that that should be a person's choice right now unless they can prove that it's going to hurt the entire population which I don't believe they've done an efficient job in doing that. So as someone who is uh, you know practicing Graham and Buffett's methodology of kind of looking at the fundamentals looking at long term this is a total black swan for you and your type of analysis because you understand very well that those fundamentals now are extremely skewed and going to be distorted because of all the stuff that's going on. How do you deal with that as someone from a long-term investment perspective? Do you do you do what Buffett's doing, which is kind of go to cash and, and just ride it, wait and see what what happens, or are you staying set? Well, you, you could do you can do is at some point, yes, we're going to get skewed a little bit here, but I can go back five, ten years and see how the company's been doing. And if we know it's a black swan event where this is something that may over time basically change, then you can still, like you did in 2009, there was incredible opportunities, yeah. but you had to buy the right company. I mean, but Buffett was investing in Goldman Sachs and GE. He was at a 10% dividend. So think about it. He was getting guaranteed 10% on his money. Forget about the convertibles and all the other stuff that was going on. So yeah. I think the bigger question that is really making this difficult right now from the school of Buffett is what's going to survive? Yeah. What will be around? What's sustainable into the future uh, based upon what this new world's going to look like? And so he was spending his first quarter buying back stock. Yeah. You know, People got on him for that. And he's like, why? It was it was a good value for us, and and he didn't see right now at this point in time it being a good value anymore. So he was seeing the stock price dropping. He probably was, you know, he was selling his stock probably before he probably saw there was going to be a correction. Smart guy. And yeah. so I think just like anything else, the hardest thing about this is going to be, you know, it's not necessarily an investor's market at the moment. But it doesn't mean you have to go out and sell what you own. You can protect your portfolio with options. I, you know how I love with options. So there's an opportune way to hedge your positions with different leveraged asset classes that might be able to help you in these difficult times. So you know, one of the things that we don't have that opportunity with, with retirement plans is it's an all or nothing. Either you're all in, in, in cash or you're all in, in stock. 
And I say that bonds equities. So you don't have the opportunity to protect it. And that's why we play that really bad game. And you know that you've heard it your whole life. It, it's, an, it's an escalator to the top and it's an elevator to the bottom. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> right? so, so I think that's going to be the next phase of this is a wait and see and just manage what you have and take inventory and start looking at sectors. And if it looks like that sector is going to be in some pain, you got to make the decisions that are right for you. Yeah, Larry. Um, I know you're you're a busy man. You're working all kinds of stuff. Uh, any anything you want to share with the viewers? Any classes you're teaching or stuff going on in your world? Yeah, I've been really busy. So uh, I will be teaching May 11th. I'll be teaching an options class online, which is great. Uh, I've been doing about two or three of them in the past, and uh, yeah, it's been kind of fun to just kind of seeing how these markets have been reacting and being able to utilize options to take advantage of them. So yeah, that's pretty much what I'll be doing. And I'll let you know about the airlines because my wife and I are getting on a plane uh, to go back to Indiana for my stepson's graduation. Nice. And so we're high, uh, college graduation. So I'll let you know what the plane situation's like. Nice, well, we'll take some <laughs> there, pictures. There better, be a lot, there, better, there better be a lot of peanuts. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, I have to do one other comment here before I wrap up here, Larry. Um, I, as you know, I'm a huge music fan as well, and one of my favorite songs uh, done by Steely Dan, who I can see in the background there, you got a nice poster of Steely Dan. It's funny because 2019 was one of those years where a lot of people look back and go, man, that year sucked. I can't wait for this friggin' year to be over. Let's move forward. Now we're in 2020, you're like, please, for the love of God, bring back 2019. So the song of the day is Hey 19 by Steely Dan. How about that? <laughs> love it, love it. Hey, anything by Steely Dan, Gives everybody a, a, a hope of optimism. That's right. All right, Larry, thank you so much for coming out and uh, sharing us uh, some of your thoughts from the Warren Buffett conference this weekend. Uh, always a pleasure having you on. Look forward to having you back again soon, my friend. Thank you, Marlon. Have a great rest of your week, and congrats on the show. You're doing really great, and uh, I'll see you soon. Sounds good, Larry. Take care. Bye. Bye. Guys, that was Larry Jacobson. Uh, so online trading academy he'll be doing some options classes so let me dial my volume down sorry about that guys for some reason skype always hijacks my microphone and every time i turn it off it spikes in audio so i'm hoping my audio levels are a little bit better there all right um let me real quickly go to see a couple comments here and i want to um address those because there were some good ones um tom Barr. he says many people want to go back to normal yes i think we I, I would I, I would say that every single one of us, 100% of Americans, want to go back to normal. This is a sh well. Actually, I can, let me take that back. I have a couple really uh, introvert friends who feel like this is the greatest thing ever because they don't have to leave their houses. Let's say the vast majority of Americans want to go back to normal. He says 30% uh, will be back right away, 50% days later, and 80% will be back within weeks. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I, I have, honestly, I'm not a. That's where I don't have any expertise. Anything I could offer there is simply a, a, a speculation on my part. I do think that the estimates that everybody are throwing out there as far as how we'll get back on track, I think that they're stretching it because I agree with Brendan here, which says, I believe there will be a secondary outbreak, now, especially when you have these morons going and having huge congregations and protesting. Look, I'm all for the right to, to do what you want to do. That's the freedom we have in America. But at a certain point, you got to understand that the whole point of this was so we don't spike the hospitals with cases of coronavirus and if you have you know 50,000 people marching down the streets in Southern California protesting all cluttered together the odds are that the distribution of any coronavirus that we've been trying to avoid for months and months and months is now all of a sudden null and void you've basically just said you know what I've been in home for months trying not to spread this virus but I'm gonna go hang out with a bunch of people in very close quarters and spread that virus so we'll see what the outbreak issue is here in Southern California in a couple of weeks hopefully it won't be bad and, and maybe it's a good ends up being a good thing where we can look back in hindsight and say see we didn't get a spike from it I don't know personally I deep down in my heart I feel like this is just a really overly fabricated thing from our governments to make us all fearful but I'm not here to run a conspiracy show I'm here to run a show about trading, investing, financial markets, education, understanding. So uh, I just wanted to get to that one. The other part here, <clears throat> Mike, you went a little bit dark on us. There are, I, I had this comment with a couple friends of mine, which was when you're in prison, and I've never been to prison, I don't, I'm never going to go to prison, but it, when you're in prison, I've watched a lot of movies on prison. Whenever they put that person in solitary confinement, they always tend to go crazy. They're the ones that come out of the hole being a complete loon. If you think about it, most of us right now have been in solitary confinement for over a month. So I agree with Mike. I think that there is going to be some, um, let's just say some very strange things that happen in the near future, uh, especially with regards to 
bad events. And I really, knocking on wood, I hope it doesn't happen. But boy, it just seems to me like the longer that we stay cooped up in our homes, the more we get inside our heads, the more we start maybe battling with depression or other issues. And it's going to have its day in the sun when we finally get out of our home. So hopefully uh, we can be there to help each other out when somebody starts going down that rabbit hole of depression and, and having some issues. But it just seems to me like that is a very high probability after all this settles. And we'll have to figure out what happens when, uh, when everyone goes nuts. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. All right, you guys are going to that conversation there. All right, uh, if you guys liked Larry Jacobson, I'm going to try to bring him on more on the program. As you guys know, he works for Online Trade Academy. He's doing a ton of the content. He'll be teaching an options class here, as he mentioned, starting May 11th. So you can find out more information at tradingacademy.com. Uh, if you like Larry, go ahead and do me a favor. Give me a thumbs up. A nice little thumbs up would be great. Now, I'm going to go to the very beginning here because Dave, I believe it was Dave. Let me go all the, I have to scroll all the way up on the chats, guys, because it was a long time ago. Uh, yes. And Dave says, looking for some positive vibes today. I totally suck at trading right now. By right now, I mean always. Okay. Someone's, you, you need, you need a hug, Dave. You need a hug. And I could see that uh, Jorge was kind of emphasizing the same thing. Look, we will all go through challenging times, and I've actually gotten a lot of emails from viewers, so I'm, I'm trying to, to, to subtly address these issues without just going straight at it. Um, there will be times where you go through struggles, and I love what Sam Evans talked about in the program the other day. I am an absolute preacher of this as well, which is when you look and you see things are getting very wild, and how do we determine wild? Simply look at the ATR. Look at how much that security is moving. If it's moving two, three, four, to five times normal, you cannot trade the same way that you did before. It's just not possible. Because if you trade the same way, you're gonna have the same stop losses, but now it's moving five times as much, boom, you're gonna get taken out almost every little move that happens. So we have to first understand what that security is doing, how much it's moving. Number two is we have to adjust our risk management. So let's say that something's moving an average of 10 cents a day. I'm making up numbers here just for a simple example because I, I don't have a drawing tool to help out. But let's say a security moves 10 cents a day and you're using the daily chart to plan your trades. You said, okay, if it moves 10 cents a day, I'm gonna have a 10 cent stop. And to do that, I will trade a um, thousand shares. That way my stop loss is gonna be a hundred dollars. Thousand shares, 10 cent stop loss, I'm risking hundred bucks per trade. Now all of a sudden we are in the market that we're in right now where you have market action that's close to five times normal. So what that means is, everything normal, you should be looking at a stop loss that's not 10 cents. It's probably going to be closer to 50. So now if I trade that same thousand shares with a $50 stop loss, I'm now risking $500. I have now five times my risk. Instead of doing that, why don't I drop my share size to 200 shares, take a 50 cent stop, um, a 50 cent stop loss, I'm still now risking $100. So I've, I've modified two factors there, my share size to help me with my risk management and my stop loss to help me understand the dynamics of the security that I'm trading. That one step will probably help you out quite a bit. Of course, that's not the only answer because there's so much going on right now in these markets. I mean, the volatility is off the charts. You're seeing things just flip flop like crazy, one day bullish, next day bearish. So it's really, really difficult to, to have that kind of consistency when the markets have been so choppy. Now, of course, we could look at the daily charts and say, well, we've had a strong trend down and now a strong trend up. True, but there's just a lot of chop within that. And again, that's why we have to kind of modify and stretch things out a little bit with regards to our stop losses. That would probably help quite a bit. All right, uh, let's see. Almost the same problems went back into SIM. And, and that's always a good thing you can do. Fernan says he went back into SIM. Uh, no problem with going into simulator at all. Just the difference there is the SIM doesn't give you the profits or losses. It also doesn't give you the emotions. And I, I would personally say stay in the game. But if you're trading stocks, for example, most sites aren't charging you commissions. So you go back with just a couple of shares, right? Just go back with a couple of shares, just skin in the game. My old mentor years ago, he'd tell me when he went on a bad losing streak, and, and this guy had been trading for years and it happened to him all the time, he'd just all of a sudden go on a bad losing streak. Hard to predict when they happen, they just come out of nowhere. Well, when that happened, he said what he would do is he would go back to trading one share. And, I, and this is a guy that normally would trade anywhere between 1,000 and 5,000 shares at a time. This is what we did as scalpers. He'd go back to one share, and I'm like, dude, it's not even gonna cover the cost of commissions. He goes, I don't care about the commission cost. He says, I wanna make sure that that trade shows up positive because for some reason in his brain, and it actually works for me too, and it might work for many of you out there, if, if you start losing, your brain says, I'm a loser. And on Dave, honestly, by the way that you wrote that comment, actually tells me that you feel like you're a loser right now. And you're setting yourself up for failure that way. 
So what he would do is he'd go back to one share, be positive and say, I won, I won. And just doing that would re kind of calibrate his brain and put him towards positivity. Now don't go from one share to 5,000 shares, but you slowly start to build back up till you get your confidence because the market has an uncanny way of destroying your confidence. It's like the girl that you want to date who's always slamming you. You know what? You got to move on to another girl or you can find a solution there. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Joseph, you, you can. It's, it's just about your mindset. Um, the most challenging thing we have in trading in financial markets is our brain, without a doubt. It's not the analytics. It's just understanding how these markets move and what our brain is saying on a regular basis because our brain will really uh, throw you for a loop sometimes. All right, let me go and show you guys... Um, the earnings calendar. I wanted to get this out of the way so I can uh, wrap up our show today because I know you guys are you're on the watch stopwatch checking to see an hour show. Nope, not going to do an hour show today. Um, here's your earnings calendar for tomorrow. Uh, today we really, well we did have um, Disney reported earnings today and they didn't do very well. Let me real quickly show you what happened today. They reported after the market. Here is Disney. Yeah. So Disney missed by 23 cents, which you know probably is happening because of the Disney resorts. I mean, obviously they're shut down, so that's going to be a massive drain for them. Um, but they're probably doing okay with regards to their film and production stuff and, and their TV or their network. Uh, that was your earnings today. Uh, tomorrow, this is what we've got cooking. And there's a lot of big names out there. You've got Novo Nordisk, PayPal, uh, CVS Healthcare, T-Mobile. Shopify, that will be an interesting one. I mean, that chart of Shopify I showed earlier is just unbelievable. What a crazy chart. Zoits, Equinix, uh, Global Payments, Barrett Gold for Brendan out there because he's the gold bear, gold bug. Uh, waste Management, and that's pretty much it. You get General Motors, Square, uh, and Franco Nevada. Those are a couple of big names out there as well reporting earnings tomorrow. Now, the economic front's a little bit different. Uh, of course, we have some announcements happening. What I want you guys to do is real quick, just zoom in your eyes at the top of the screen here. This is the one that should just make you go, oh, Holy crap, are you kidding me? Uh, check this out. I'm highlighting the two top two there because those are kind of the main ones for the U.S. At 5.15 in the morning, this is all uh, Pacific time. Sorry, I go off Pacific time here. If you look at that, you have a the previous month was negative 27,000 job changes, meaning the, the economy for the, jo the market for jobs dropped by 27,000. It's dropped by 20 million now. <laughs> That's the expectation. And we talk about never before seen in history that is one of those numbers that you just go, wow, shake your head out. Anyway, that number comes out tomorrow. Also, crude oil inventories, which uh, could have a dramatic impact on the crude oil, which has been on a very nice run lately. The other area of interest for tomorrow is going to be down here near the bottom. You obviously have the British pound doing a uh, rate vote. Right now, they're at 10 basis points, 0.10%. Um, the part that's of interest would be that official bank rate votes, which you see it says 009. The first zero means... Uh, how many people want to raise the rates? Second zero is how many people want to lower the rates? And the third number is how many want to keep it right where it's at? So all expectations right now are saying they're going to keep it right where it's at, no change. So it's really um, the report after the announcement to see what their stance is and how they might change things going forward. So that is your economic announcements. That's some of your earnings announcements for tomorrow. Hopefully, uh, you guys will have a great session out there. I think that the, the ADP non-farm employment change is going to be uh, one of those catalysts for the market. Now, again, that happens about an hour and 15 minutes before the U.S. equity markets open, so that should already be priced in. But if you're trading the futures markets, you'll probably see some pretty big swings about that time. All right. I think I pretty much got everything. Yeah, again, if you guys like Larry and you liked uh, or if you like my show or whatever, uh, if you want to support us, give us that little thumbs up there. We'd appreciate that. Of course, you can always send in questions. Go to TraderMerlin.com if you want to send in questions. There's a button right on that front screen that will allow you to send a question directly to us. And uh, I'm kind of piling those up, getting those ready for different shows. Tomorrow, I have a show all by my lonesome yet again. So I will be uh, going over a bunch of listener questions. Again, you can do it one of two ways. If there's something that's personal that you don't want to share with public, you can always send it in at TraderMerlin.com. And of course, if you don't want me to mention your name, just say don't mention my name. If not, I'll mention your first name usually. Uh, the other piece of this is if you um, put your comments down below the YouTube videos, those I'm giving priority to. So those are mainly be the ones I'm going to be answering on tomorrow's show. All right, everybody, that will do it for me. Again, thank you so much. Um, let's see, what, what, Teresa, what, what, what did Teresa say? Maybe not, Mike, what did you say? Oh, I, I can't find my comment out there. Uh, well, good to have you, Teresa. Thank you so much. Yes, looking for, uh, forward to a better, uh, not a better, and another great show tomorrow. It's going to be a fun one. Hopefully your trades will be green. Until then, happy trading, everybody. I will see you tomorrow.